Great, thank you. You can tell Star Wars was on my mind as I was putting this together. I think they had just come out to say that the new movie was going to be uh, directed by J.J. Abrams, and I got really excited, so I put it into all sorts of different talks. Anyway, um, it's really an honor to be here uh, at the sort of center of food studies in the UK, and it's also uh, slightly dangerous as well. So uh, it's a bit risky to be here and give a talk. Um, but also uh, to be amongst people that uh, have, uh, and leading scholars that have really sort of influenced me in my thinking. And uh, it's nice to see everybody here and uh, a lot of friendly faces, and I really appreciate that. So this is going to be, this is a speculative talk. Can you hear me in the back? Is that all right? Okay. So this is, this is a very speculative talk related to some work that's been done uh, by myself and one of my PhD students, Christine Barnes, which really connects up to an online survey that we've done about people's responses to celebrity chefs, okay? But it's also kind of speculative in terms of the kind of theoretical and conceptual framing around which I'm going to pitch this, this wider topic around the audience responses to celebrity chefs which not very many people have done. In fact, nobody's done yet, as of yet. If you find somebody who's done that, please tell me and send it to me. I've done as much searching as I can, but I can't find it anywhere. Okay, so may the fork be with you. Celebrity chefs and the cultural biopolitics of good food. To, to, to situate this talk, Chris talked a little bit about my, my wider interests around celebrities. And so this is, this is part of a much wider kind of set of questions that I have. How are contemporary society-nature relationships society development or poverty relationships, and society and food relationships being governed. Well, for me, these are three relationships that are being mediated and framed by the media in the form of celebrities, in the body of celebrities, the people who can pronounce on these particular topics. So some examples you can see, the way that the environmental issue has been mediated by celebrities. These are Vanity Fair doing green issues over three years, Right? If you didn't know it, Madonna was an echo warrior. I bet you didn't know that. Now you do. Okay? We think about development. Society development relationship is mediated by the sexiest man on the planet. So here he is coming out of the White House, speaking, after speaking to Obama about Darfur. Here we have Bill Gates, who's interested in everything that has to do with Africa. There's the halo, right? There he is. Okay? Uh, it's gotten so, to, to such a point that we can now draw a map of what celebrities have divided up Africa, right? Bringing in these issues about neocolonialism, all sorts of interesting things that I don't have time to get into. And obviously about food, right? So here is, um, what's this, this, Danny Boyle, is that right? Yeah, so the, the Olympics guy. This was at, these are celebrities, famous people talking at the Enough Food for Everyone uh, uh, event that was in London in Hyde Park uh, last summer. Who's this woman? I have no idea, but she's famous, and she's wearing the shirt, right? So some celebrity. And then we even had Bill Gates there. He's everywhere, as I said. He's all over the place, okay? So talking about food, and obviously we've got celebrity chefs involved in this discussion as well. Here's the food fight that was over in the United States. Here we have Jamie over, over here doing his program with the school dinners. And there's Hugh with the fish, right, connected to his campaign, The Fish Fight. Okay, which uh, is, is, has now had the common fisheries policy changed at the European Parliament. So celebrities can have impacts uh, in, in interesting ways. Okay. So what I've tried to talk about is the celebritization of food, environment, and development. And this idea of, and it's very, very initial stages of this idea, this idea of celebrities as tools of governance. You'll see some of this Foucauldian language come through. I'm not a Foucauldian at all, but I like the language and the ability to use that kind of language. Celebrities as tools of governance or governance tools to get us to frame issues, to think about the solutions and the problems. Celebrity chefs are very much uh, right at the center of that, especially those activist celebrity chefs. Okay, so the talk outline. What am I going to talk about today? So I'm going to have some, some statements to kind of set the, the scene about food and food biopolitics and celebrity chefs. Under this heading, the contemporary disturbance in the edible forces, right, going right back to Star Wars. The rising and spreading media constructions of good food. So just some statements about that. You can agree with me or disagree with me as, uh, when I get to the end of the talk. How might we make sense of celebrity chefs? I'm going to give you a, a series of different ways we might want to start to think about analyzing celebrity chefs. And then something about some, some, some issues about what's missing in some of those ways of analyzing these things. 
And I'm going to kind of make a pitch for this idea of the kind of cultural biopolitics of food. Again, this is not a kind of grand theorization, but part of what it's doing is engaging in a conversation with Julie Guthman and Becky Mansfield, who have started to talk about the biopolitics of food and trying to add on to some of the things that they're talking about. In particular, the importance of the cultural context, i.e. media, around food that's not considered in the work that they've done as of yet. Okay, so uh, it's building on this type of work, and I'll get to that. I'm going to show you some survey results from the Celebrity Chef survey. This is all raw data. There's not much analysis that's been done. Okay? I've done a little bit, but not too much. Okay? So I'm just going to throw it out there for you to see what people have said about celebrity chefs and what they think about them. This is part of Christine Barnes' PhD. And then absolutely lame conclusions, because I'm going to throw so much information out at you. I'm going to have some very weak and anodyne and some very, very short conclusions at the end, because I think I'm probably going to give you enough as I go through this talk. Okay. So, start with a number of statements to set the, steam, the scene. We are at or emerging at peak food. We are. Food is everywhere. It is all over the place. And in fact, we are so there, I've had to call on the uh, help of an 800-year-old philosopher to give us a sense of what this might mean. So there he is. Food's energy surrounds us. It binds us. You must feel the food around you. Here between you, me, the TV, the kitchen, the fork, everywhere. There are now these extreme concerns over food. Too much, too little, the quality, the taste, the origin, where it comes from, how to prepare it, what's in it, the nutrition, what others are eating. We are obsessed with what other people are eating. So you can see food in kind of popular culture, and here I'm kind of plagiarizing myself, a piece that I'm working on for, at the moment. We celebrate it, we are entertained by it, we deplore it, we explore it, we historicize it. We voyeurize it. We fictionalize and document food in, <clears throat> in every possible guise. Third point. Now, just to not, not to get away too far from my political economy street cred, right? Okay? We need to think about the fact that food is at the center of the experience and resistances to austerity and inequality. It's not just about media. There's stuff out there. Again, forming the kind of background of which, around which these celebrity chef programs are starting to arise and shift. Fast food worker strikes in the United States. So food, fast food workers are talking about a living wage. So food is connected to living wage inequality, particularly in the United States. I don't know if you've seen this in the news already. We get the rise of the food bank and breadline Britain and the spread over to Europe. There's been some great investigative reporting about the rise in the food banks in the UK. And that ties into these food debates about food and discussions about food get into these issues about that, that wider context about takers versus makers. And the issue about food stamps and food banks. So you see the, the kind of right-wing demonization of the poor as the, as the welfare state pulls back even further and further. This is about food and these discussions about that are at the center of these discussions and wider con interests about takers and makers, who's good, who's bad in society. The constructions of citizenship in particular. So a quote from uh, Edwina Curry, the former health minister, Tory. So in a response, this was a couple days ago, response to the tripling of the use of food banks in a year. And you can see this kind of demonization coming out. As anyone, this is a quote from her, as anyone with their wits about them can grasp, if you increase the free supply of something worth having, you'll have takers queuing at the door. I get very troubled at the number of people who are using food banks, but they never learn to cook, they never learn to manage, and the moment they've got a spare bit of cash, they're off getting another tattoo. Coming from the woman who had an illicit affair with John Major. I love it. Okay. We also have the highest income inequality since the Great Depression. So this, again, is forming the kind of background of this chef-type moment. Food has taken center stage. So just to embed this again in popular culture through all different types and forms of media. So here he is again. Food media's energy now surrounds us and it binds us, right? So calling back on Yoda to give us some more information about what's happening. You must feel the food media around you, et cetera, et cetera. So just to embed that a bit more. What we find ourselves in is this kind of distinct moment of the overdetermination of food and food media. And in this, you have both issues about disciplining, what you're not supposed to eat, 
and pleasure. And they sit side by side. They're kind of contradictions of these things. So you have shows about what not to eat. You have shows about what to eat. And they sit very much side by side. And you can look at that, and you can see this through all these different genre of different programs. This is one year of programming in the UK only. We've got a series of advocacy programs, investigative reporting, fun food facts. You've got cookery programs, self-help programs, and the confessional. Voyeurism, hey, it's not me, thank God, I'm not eating that. I don't look like that person. Demo the documentary, the history program, and of course, competition. One of the most popular programs is MasterChef. How many of you have watched MasterChef? Yeah, a lot of people, right? So we have, uh, again, as a part of these different genres, you get the rise of the professional taster and what's known as the taste-gasm as part of the performance of these shows. And there he is. Oh, my God. <laughs> right? So that becomes a part of these performances. So this is also a part of these kind of wider lifestyle and reality television turn of the kind of self-work and self-governance that goes into a lot of these different programs. So all the DIY programs about improving yourself, improving your house, it's become its own sort of genre as well. Fifth, from this we can see the rise in the beginning outlines of a kind of series of stable figures or archetypes in the media foodscape. You get the foodie, you get the food poor person, you get the reformed over or unhealthy eater or weight loser you get, of course, the celebrity chef. Following on from the chef, because I've started to think, what's next after the chef, after, that, after these programs play themselves out? Well, we now get the rise of the austerity food blogger. Has anybody heard of Jack Monroe? Yeah, very popular now. She has her own Guardian column. The whole thing was the fact that she uh, was a mom on benefits and could feed her family for 10 pounds a week. Okay, she, she, uh, she uh, started to, to talk about this on her blog and it got very popular. She now has a Guardian column, she now has a cookbook, she's now in Sainsbury's magazine, she's the face of Sainsbury's food basically. So this is what the standard had to say about her. Her good looks and embattled cheer make her a poster girl for resourceful austerity. So there they are, the rich standing on the sidelines clapping away, right? Here's a picture of her. The point with this, she now gets to sit side by side, shoulder to shoulder with Jamie Oliver. Okay? So now we've got another figure on this landscape. Celebrity chefs, and we start to talk about them as one of these widest archetypes, well, but they have a kind of variation and a personality in their brand. So you get the holiday chef, Elaine Pascal, who always comes out at Christmas. You get the chop and chat chef. You get the experimental chef, Heston. You get the everyday celebrity chef, the master chef winner, who then go on to start their own restaurants, have their own shows and their own cookbooks. You get the I'll get you healthy for cheap chef, Jamie's current kind of incarnation. Come on, guys, let's cook something healthy. Sorry, I don't have a cockney, mockney accent. And, uh-oh, what's going on? Oop. To the overly political chef, so Jamie, Hugh, Jimmy, Arthur Potts, Dawson. So these people have become, these, so we, an, another sort of figure are the overtly political chefs. Uh, and these are some of the other names that have come up, and uh, Arthur Potts, Dawson in particular, he's friends with Jamie, and so is, so is Jimmy Doherty. So they've kind of fed into that social relationship that they have. All right, so how might we make sense of these celebrity chefs? And I'm going to give you a couple of different ways, a few other ways to kind of make sense of these people. What are they doing? What's happening? What's working? But what we need to do is build on and be embedded in previous or current work on food and media chefs. A lot of this is coming out of cultural and media studies, and a lot of it is based on cultural and discourse analysis. So looking at television programs, what are they telling us? How are they constructing different things? How are they framing things? So uh, Sina Rousseau's got a couple of books. Uh, this book, Food, Self, and Identity, is excellent. And Joanne Hollows from Nottingham has done some really interesting work on uh, Jamie and all the four big four chefs. And this book is about uh, 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 chef, uh, the rise of kind of the cultural capital of chefs. Agri-food studies people have also got in the game, so we've got Suzanne Friedberg writing way back in 2004 about the rise of uh, media and the way that media works to shame corporations. And then Nick Piper, who's a student of uh, Peter Jackson's, done some work on audience analysis of Jamie's shows. It's some really interesting stuff. But a lot of it is critical discourse analysis of advertisements and labels. Even uh, my own previous work fits into that. 
So there is more to come. I've got a, um, I'm leading the way with a, uh, a celebrity chef special issue in food culture and society, and then one on food, media, and space in Geoforum, and these are in the works as we speak. So these will com be coming out over the next couple of years, okay? So feeding into these kind of conversations. So celebrity chefs. So if we start to think about how might we make sense of celebrity chefs, the first two pay particular homage to Julie Guthman, right? Somebody who, who comes from a political economy kind of background. How can we think about them? Well, first, a kind of canny response to the moral panics and the crises of capitalism, what she calls the paradoxes of capitalism in some of her work. In the context of food, you get obesity and anorexia sitting side by side. Time shortages, the ecological destruction around food production, low wages, right? So chefs have been a response to this, the rise of the chef. So they're, in a sense, pitched as a kind of self-help and self-improvement. So you see chefs as these kind of governance tools of neoliberal responsibilization. But it's often more complex than that, okay? So it's not just about telling us what we need to do and responsibilizing us through the television shows as consumers. There are a number of different shows that have started to do and become what um, this Bell et al. piece starts, David Bell talks about as the campaigning culinary documentary. So they've started to talk about the role of corporations and governments in terms of their responsibilities in the food supply. So it's more complex, it's slightly more complex than this. There's, there's a lot of things going on out there. Second, we can think of celebrity chefs as a kind of canny form, a creative form of creative capitalism. So the kind of culinary capital of chefs and the circulations and flows of real capital, the connections between that person as a brand and a commodity and the way that builds up the value for those television stations as well, Channel 4 in particular. So to paraphrase one of the lines of Julie's book, her latest book on obesity, when you turn on television food media, you are turning on capitalism with the images as one moment in those kind of flows of culinary and real capital. So that's the second way we might think about it. So right, so we could start to name it the chef media capital complex or the chef industrial complex, if we wish. Celebrity Chefs 3 are a kind of, or a possibility, a way to think about them, an expression of this kind of moment of austerity. And again, you can think of some of the latest shows, Jamie's Money Saving Meals. But more broadly, this is, is this about watching good food instead of eating it? The ability of people to then buy those products that they're showing on their chef shows has been reduced. So in a sense, this is about kind of cook entertainment or eatertainment in this particular moment of austerity. Fourth, and this is the point that I really find really interesting and want to follow up a lot more on. We think about celebrity chefs in these shows, more abstractly, they create these kind of moments of possibility for us to act. They give us ideas, what to cook, what to eat, moments of possibility. You can think about these kind of moments, we'll break it down just a little bit more, these moments of personal and social responsibility. So the ability to cook healthfully in responsibility for oneself, or one's family. We can think about the kind of political possibilities that go along with these programs. Hughes Fish Fight, it was all about getting consumers to ask at supermarkets for other types of fish, getting you to be a kind of guerrilla consumer. So the, and the political possibilities that go along with that, to change the food, fish supply. So you see these kind of moments of possible food action for those watching, reading, and engaging in all forms of chef-based media. But this, of course, brings out some of the contradictions here, the kind of gendered and classed moments that these moments of possibility are, okay? So that we need to think about that a little bit more, do a little bit more research in thinking about that, the way that they're kind of paradoxical, again, in a way. Gendered and classed moments, but they also might potentially be democratic in the sense that they bring good and healthy food to the people. Need to do a bit more work on that. And that's where this survey is embedded, okay? You'll see some of those questions and, and some of those concerns echoing through the, the survey as I go through it. 
So what does this sense-making not tell us? What does it not tell us? What do those five or six different ways of analyzing celebrity chefs not tell us? Well, what they don't tell us is what actual people think of chefs as a form of governance. What are their impacts on people? How do chefs gain this kind of culinary capital, which is relationally produced, right? If you had a chef and you didn't have an audience, you wouldn't have a celebrity chef. It's produced with these audiences in the first place. So how do they gain this kind of cultural capital? What do people make of it? What do actual people do with these moments of possibility or potentiality? This is possibly more than just watching. And for whom? Who does it matter? Does it change people's thinking about food and their behaviors? So we think about kind of media studies terms, this idea of parasocial relationships. I might think I have a relationship with uh, Brad Pitt, but I don't really, right? He might be talking to me and speaking to me, but I don't really have a relationship, okay? It's a parasocial relationship. Amongst, so the question is, what are the kinds of parasocial relations among audiences, chefs, media, and food? So let's put this more broadly. What discursive and material work do celebrities do on audiences and societies? If we want to put it in Foucauldian terms, on populations. Where and what are these resistances to this work? Where do people come to think about these things in a different way and resist them, possibly? Or deflect them? So these are the sets of questions we need to focus on. And to me, that needs to be done through this idea of a kind of cultural biopolitics of food. So chefs are, so follow, follow this through. See if, you, see, if you, uh, see if you think this works. Chefs are doing work on audiences and populations through the specifically cultural means and modes of the media. So this work is done in the context of individual food cultures, society's food cultures, people's food ways, of individuals and society at large. So any work on the kind of self or other in the context of this food is indeed, pulling from Nicholas Rose, who's done a lot of work around this, about the politics of life itself. Food is about the politics of life itself, especially in these, especially in these kind of cultural and media debates about what is good food. Good food is that food we should be eating that is constructed by, in this case, celebrity chefs. It might be really tasty food. It might be really healthy food. It might be really tasty food that's unhealthy. It might be really healthy food that's tasty. Okay, but we have this rising discourse about what is good food. So in these constructions of good food, what are the kinds of, and the question for me, what are the kinds of key cultural means of self-governance? And how are these actually engaged with at the level of the everyday? So what does this mean for agri-food work? Okay, this is a dangerous bit. You might disagree with this. Coming into the house of agri-food studies. Okay, so what does this mean for agri-food work? Well, for me, simple point. We need to, as agri-food scholars, take food media seriously, in geography in particular. Okay, cultural studies people have done this already. We need to now do this. We need to take it seriously and much beyond the kind of critical discourse analysis that goes on. So to me, this is about developing a much more kind of relational biopolitics, okay? So Becky's work in particular is building off of Becky Mansfield's work, where she's looked at the discourses around safe eating for pregnant women from the government in seafood. What she did in her analysis is analyze and do a discourse analysis and tie that to questions about biopolitics. So what we need to think about developing is a more relational biopolitics by building on this existing work. So to me, this is about placing this work in the kind of social and cultural context that gets at two things for me. A much more lived and immediate kind of genealogy of who and why those decisions are being made about chef and food programs. Who is actually deciding what Jamie's program is going to look like? What production company and person gets to decide what the fish fight looks like and why? So how are these biopolitics being created behind the scenes? Which is one of the things that these guys don't do. 
So getting behind the scenes, how is this stuff produced? Second, what are the complex and contradictory work that these biopolitics do on real and actual people, audiences and populations? That means we need to talk to people. We need to talk to audiences. How are they taking these and understanding these kind of biopolitics from celebrity chefs? Is that making sense? Okay. Right, so building on from there, tying into people like uh, the Hayes Conroy's work around visceral geographies and food, and Julie's work around the political ecologies of bodies. So if we are to begin a kind of political ecology of bodies, think about the relationships between bodies and food and environments and politics, in the context of healthy and good food, what are the kind of cultural and media contexts within which they operate? That to me is the big question. Okay, so, perfect timing. Now, what happens when you talk to people about celebrity chefs? So now we're gonna get into the survey work. So what we did is do an online survey. The N at this particular time around this data was about 200 to 250. We now have up to 650 different people majority of whom are Christine fr Christine's friends, so they're female. Okay, a lot of undergraduates at King's College. There are also a lot of people in this middle age range between 22 and 40. So that's the majority of the respondents there, okay? But that's important because those, that is the population that these shows are trying to reach. So I don't have much of a problem with how, in, a, in effect, this, this skewed this is, okay, at the moment. We are in the process of putting focus groups together, and she's now doing interviews and has been doing interviews of uh, production companies, assistants to Jamie and other people, et cetera, et cetera, okay? She's also gonna do some interviews with consumers once we get to that point. So the sets of questions that we asked people to tie back into some of those much wider questions that I had about cultural biopolitics. Series of five different areas. What are people's awareness of chefs and programs? How and where did they get the inform do they get information on food more broadly? Not just about chefs, but we wanted to find out where chefs fit into people's information gathering about food. And who and where did they trust? What information? Okay. Third part, reasons for watching these particular programs. Fourth part, the affects the affective connections, and the effects, okay? So thinking about emotion, care, did that shift how people cared about food by watching a program? And how did it change their behavior? And then these questions specifically about chefs and politics. We wanted to find out if people thought chefs should even be involved in being political and active. Okay. So, the first set of questions, awareness of chefs and programs. Please name up to five celebrity chefs you are aware of, and I'm just going to run through these, okay? Lots of raw data, but there's some interesting points in here that came up. So, chosen from across the first three answers from each respondent, who do you think came up first as the most popular celebrity chef? There he is, Jamie. 88%. Who do you think's next? You would think so. Swear, swearing actually pays off. So, <laughs> Gordon Ramsay, 50%. There's Nigella. Delia Smith, who's now pulled out because she says that celebrity chefs are a waste of time. It's not about, anyway, there's a, whole, there's a whole lot going on there, too. And Heston Blumenthal down at the bottom. Hugh Friendly Whittingstall only comes up as 23%. Which of the following food programs have you watched? Please tick all that apply. A lot of these questions were, please tick all that apply, because we know there are multiple answers to these things, okay? And the complexity that comes along with that uh, in people's responses, but also the complexity that comes along with the analysis. Master Chef, 80%, which is clear. You all raised your hands, or a lot of you. 30, Jamie's 30 Minute Meals got 66%. But if you look down here, the more political programs came down at the bottom. Interesting. Okay, again, some more questions about awareness and chefs and programs. When thinking about food and cooking in the media, how do you predominantly engage with celebrity chefs? Clearly, the first answer is going to be television. 
38% cookbooks. Hold on to this, okay? Hold on to that because it's going to come back in another question. Interesting bit to me, right? So again, they're trying this target audience that they're trying to, to, to focus on. You guys are all on Facebook and Twitter, allegedly, right? All the time. Look at where social media and food blogs came, down at the bottom. So much less important than televisions, the old, old school way of approaching things, right? But cookbooks are up there. Where do you most regularly look for information about food? What and how to eat? And what do you think was the top answer? Where do people generally look for information about food to eat? What would you say? Is it Jamie Oliver? It's not. It's friends and family, okay? And in fact, if you look across all of the responses, they're so spread out that people are looking all over the place in a range of different areas. Food programs come in only at 11% when people are looking for new information about food and where in terms of what and how to eat. Okay, so let's move on to the next section. How and where do you get information in food and who and where do you trust? What do you trust to give you that information? So the question, who do you trust to inform you what and how you eat? Okay, top answer, 52% friends and family. This is saying that people's social relationships are as important or much more important than celebrity chefs, which is the way I approached it. I thought it would be chefs first and foremost. Food labels, 42%. Food programs and the government come in much lower, 25% and 10%. Okay, some responses in terms of the elaboration about friends and family. Word of mouth and friends are generally more trustworthy and family knows best. Response about food labels. I read the labels when buying food to try and stay healthy. It's about nutritional content. Food programs. Chef programs are enjoyable and politically inert, so I enjoy the food porn aspect of them. They're mostly about getting new ideas and inspiration. And then a lot of people said there was no influence or they were actively resistant. I do not actively seek information on good food or food information as I feel like I know how and what to eat due to past knowledge gained from various sources. And probably do not need half of the media to tell me what and how I should be eating. Hmm. Well then. <laughs> All right. So some reasons for watching these chefs' programs. For the shows that you watch regularly, please tell us why. And again, we ask, please tick all that apply. 75% watch for entertainment, not to get information about food. 53%, well, it just happened to be on. Serendipitous watching. There, 50%, have an interest in food or cooking. That's one of the things we are finding with this survey. It's not new people coming to get new information. It's people who are already interested in food and food programs who come to these shows and watch them. Okay, there's the rest of the responses. Want to learn to cook new food. So let's move into the affects and effects of chefs and different programs. How often do you cook from a celebrity chef cookbook? I thought I just had to throw that in there. Everybody's got one. How many of you have a celebrity chef cookbook? Okay, 32% never cook from it, okay? 25% once or twice a year. So we have these things. They might serve other purposes in our kitchens. We need to probe that in the focus group. How do chefs affect your feelings about food? Please tick all that apply. Now this is really interesting in terms of the responses to this. So we put in a series of responses that had to do not just with feeling, but with action. Because we wanted to try and make the connection between changes in feeling and how that might be connected to action. So the number one response in terms of affecting your feelings around food, 55% said it encouraged them to cook more. 50% makes you think more about what you eat. So that was the other thing that we were trying to probe. This question about knowledge and food knowledge and how all three of these things are related. The programs, the feelings, the knowledge, and the behavior. Is it a kind of classic knowledge action gap in this case? 40% encourages you to eat less processed food. And then you have the rest of the answers down here, which I don't have time to go through. But that's really interesting. So feeling and affected feelings around your food 
The answer, the top answer, was encouraging you to cook more. There's that. And this question about knowledge makes you think more about what you eat, makes you think about where your food has come from. All right. Moving on. Do you care more about what or how you eat as a result of watching a particular celebrity chef? No. 55%. Okay? So that goes back to my point I just made previously. In a lot of cases, you got a, t you got a key on this. Do you care more about what you eat? And I think what people are saying is, we already care about it. We just then go and watch it. Okay. So that was interesting. So here are some of the qualitative responses. Yes, Jamie Oliver has influenced me to care more about where my food comes from. Keith Friendly Wittingstall greatly influences my food when cooking easier, quicker, easy day meals. He also influences my choice of fish. No or maybe. I'm already pretty interested in what we eat and in where it comes from. Watching Jamie's school dinners was the result of that, not the cause of it. Okay, that's coming up over and over and over again. How has your behavior around food changed as a result of watching Celebrity Chef Friend and Campaigns? Again, back, the answer, 61% encouraged you to cook more. Doesn't say what they're cooking, it says they're cooking more. 36%, these were the top three answers, encouraged you to eat less processed food. Again, we're back to, back to eating fresh food and, and less ready meals. 26% encourage you to buy local food, which is interesting. So there's the rest of those answers. So these are the top two that came up. So if we move into chefs and politics, do you think chefs should be doing more than teaching people how to cook? For example, should they be speaking out about the food we eat and food politics? 52% yes. Okay, I'm just gonna move on to that because I, I wanna finish and we can have time for discussion. Don't need to see the qualitative answers on that. What do you think motivates chefs to participate in food politics? i.e. getting governments to change food policy and becoming involved in the debate around food beyond cooking. Again, please tick all that apply. 84% said it was about a personal concern over the issue. They found that these people were emotive and concerned about a particular issue as a personal concern, as a chef. 73% as a way to raise their public profile. Interesting. 55% as a way for them to expand their brand. 55% to be seen to be giving back and doing more than just cooking. Right? This idea of self-interested altruism. Right? So what we have is chefs as a kind of embodiment of this idea of philanthropic capitalism. So by doing good, they're also doing good for their own brand. Do you think they are knowledgeable or could be considered expert in food politics? Look at that. 60% maybe. It depends on what we're going to see in the next set of questions. It depends on the person and it also depends on the program. That's the other finding that's come out of this. So it's if you have a personal kind of connection to a particular chef or a particular program, then you tend to answer higher in terms of your likability for that person and if they are seen as an expert. Does the celebrity chef's expertise in cooking food lend them greater credibility in speaking out on food-related politics? Yes. So the responses, and some more analysis here. People recognize that most chefs have above average knowledge about food, particularly around issues of cooking, quality, provenance, and sourcing. However, many people question their expertise beyond that. They are not to be a replacement for expertise of nutritionists, dietitians, and scientists. So they recognize the expertise and credibility, and are, both are highly dependent on the chef and the issue at hand. Who do you consider to be an expert in food politics and why? Well, going back to who was the most popular, Jamie Oliver was most often cited, and then Hugh Fernley Whittingstall comes up as a top. So he may not be one of the most popular, but he is considered an expert in food politics. Okay? They were both perceived as knowledgeable, engaging, and caring. Okay? And the important part, a lot of it had to do with their long-standing kind of campaigns with Jamie's school dinners and Hugh's fish fight, which get lots of media attention. Uh, and then you, we also had responses, academics and nutrition experts cited uh, in general terms. Tim Lang was in there. All right, go Tim. Okay. Which characteristics do you think are important in allowing chefs to speak out on food issues? 
we wanted to find out what people thought in terms of the characteristics of the chefs. What was the most important? 58%, a genuine interest or a concern in the issue. 49%, knowledgeable about food, health, and cooking. 48%, expert about food, health, and cooking. So there's a distinction between knowledge and expertise, as well as interest, which is fascinating. Okay, so I'm almost done. Last few slides. So let's think about some kind of, what, can I, what are some takeaway points from this survey that I think I've seen or Christine and I have seen in this work? Who and what is doing the work? There is an awareness of chefs and programs. It is very high, with Jamie Oliver by far and away the most mentioned chef. Yet they are not the go-to source for information, nor the most trusted. Instead, this is family and friends. So real social relationships are the most important here, not necessarily these parasocial relationships. We think about getting information about food. Does this mean chefs are less influential than we thought? Possibly. But I think what they are is a kind of part of a wider or multiple strategy of governance and self-governance that are relational to kind of other social sources of information. They're just one source of information, although they're all over the place. When we think about it on an everyday level and people's practice around food knowledge. Most watch programs are chop and chat and not the kind of specifically political programs. What work is being done? Well, it's about entertainment. It's about serendipitous watching. It just happened to be on. But there's a kind of complexity and a contingency here. The majority claim not to care more about what they eat. Again, I think it's because they already care when they come to these programs. The majority also claim that chefs encourage them to cook, think more about what they eat, and eat less processed food and ready meals. In terms of the chef work, they are concerned personally about issues, but also about their profile and their brand. People seem to be okay about that, although we haven't asked that question. Do they see a contradiction in the fact that it's about raising their profile, but also being, doing work interested in terms of their personal concerns around healthy food? So culinary capital comes from people's chefs' genuine interest, their knowledge, and their expertise. But chefs are not a replacement for other experts on health and food, and the celebrity is dependent on a particular chef and the issue. And we need to focus, we need to get into this in the focus groups. All right, to conclude, my lame conclusions, we need the massive media profile of chefs needs to be tempered with the ways people and audiences actually engage with and resist and act in the context of everyday life. I hope I've made that clear, that that's, how, that's where things need to be going and need to be headed. And they and the programs develop these kinds of moments of possibility for self-governance and wider kind of social governance of families. Cook more, eat less processed foods. That's what's kind of coming out of this work and what we're seeing. Chefs embody a kind of soft biopower. I don't know what I'm going to do with this idea, but I think there's something to do with that, okay? So it's not about cooking those particular recipes that Jamie's, right, that Jamie's putting out for us to cook. It's about cooking more and being influenced to eat more healthfully at a much more general kind of soft level. That's the idea behind that. And the biopolitics of food must include the kind of cultural and media worlds of food and the work that these cultural biopolitics do on audiences and people. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you.